Okay, welcome to another edition of lecture. In, <clears throat> today we're going to uh, take a look in the next, say, uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, see, we're going to take a look at a series of uh, television announcements that are referred to in the reading Anton. Uh, and then at the end discuss some of the relations between the cultural references in them and um, specifically take a look at some music videos uh, from Rosalia, internationally acclaimed pop star. You actually may know, have known of her or about her before um, you took this course, uh, my guess is. Um, in, I'd like to show you um, in order this, the, in, and also in chronological order, the series of um, announcements that are public, uh, publicidad, uh, television commercial announcements that are referenced in Anton, that are analyzed in Anton. Um, and that way we can take the reading and pair it with the actual visual. Um, it, I will go about explaining or translating some of the language um, as we go. Um, yeah, but without further ado then, we're moving from the 1960s and really 70s context into the present. Okay, let's take a look then. The first is in reference to uh, the cognac uh, Soberano, which we've also seen in a print ad referred to as the King of Cognacs. Um, yeah, this is uh, the advertisement that we're going to see is um, Es Cosa de Hombres, uh, which is the slogan of the jingle. In other words, it's a man's thing. Cosa de hombres. Es cosa de hombres. Es cosa de hombres. Es cosa de hombres. Y los hombres beben soberano porque soberano. The men drink soberano because it's a man's thing. Okay, so very clearly, as Anton is referring to, there is a sort of voluntary segregation here where um, the onlooker and the, the girl who is um, a protagonist here is selling the liquor, singing the jingle, um, in views different scenes, and those scenes are, cons are considered to be signs of masculinity. Uh, in other words, race cars, speed, and so on, or even doros, like the, the running of the bulls, um, it, running before a bull, that notion of danger, risk, and so on. Um, in, and then also her self-removal from the scenario is di distancing from it is that this is not um, her place. In other words, designating a feminine terrain versus a masculine terrain. The term that's used in the reading for today is macho iberico. So it's worth having that in your notes too, as to what features define that archetype of macho iberico, particularly as it comes about in the, in the uh, mid 20th century, as it's described in the mid 20th century, and also upheld as some of the archetype masculinity that we see here. <clears throat> okay, next <clears throat> is a, um, also from the 70s, <clears throat> a, an announcement uh, during the holiday season for um, a, at the end of the year uh, for a turron or a kind of uh, either like peanut brittle or fudge. <laughs> del canal. Hace siglos nació un exquisito sistema para convivir en el paso. El panal. Conquiste con tu roles el panal a los nuevos canizas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this plays on um, is Spain's medieval past and particularly um, is the the uh, romanticizing the notion of, of the caliphate, the caliphate of Cordoba, when Spain was under a Muslim rule um, for about eight centuries, actually. But the caliphate of Cordoba was a specific period in medieval rule um, when Iberia was under Muslim rule um, and the capital was Cordoba. Um, in <clears throat> the caliphate then, as we see the caliph or the, the caliph, no, um, in, is uh, the sultan figure. Um, it is, of course, a romanticization. It's also what we refer to as, in, as a kind of Orientalism. In other words, viewing from a Western and particularly um, current day or European in particular perspective. 
um, all that is non-European, including the past, say a Muslim past in Iberia, as being um, in, in somehow exotified, sometimes eroticized, um, it, um, but ultimately idealized in ways that don't correspond to a reality, a given reality, it tell us much more about the present. In this case, that present that we see is one of a heterosexual pairing um, where she is, as we're told by the narrator, trying to conquer the caliphate, uh, excuse me, conquer the, or conquest of the, um, the lover, of the husband in this case. And then it translates into a present day scene where of course the, the item of seduction is the fudge um, in, a, in a couple today. In that use of conquest too, <clears throat> interesting to note how it draws from tropes of Spanish history, the reconquest of Spain, the notion of uh, Christian rulers who are taking back territories under military campaigns for under Muslim rule, the notion of the conquest, the reconquest, um, and also that's you, that's the language that's used in the in the actual advertisement itself, the reconquista, uh, reconquistar, not to conquer, um, it, as a love interest in a way. Okay, okay, let's take another look at another one. The Kelvinator. Pórtese como un hombre. Sí, pórtese como un hombre. Ayude a su mujer a lavar con Kelvinator. Kelvinator, la máquina de lavar. Says, behave like a man, behave like a man. And that's the voiceover of the narrator. It repeats it twice. Um, it, help your wife. Um, it, let's watch it again, actually. Behave like a man. Sí. Pórtese como un hombre. Ayude a su mujer a lavar con Kelvinator. Help your wife wash clothes with the Kelvinator. In other words, we see often too, this is, this is uh, not, this is very explicit in the 1974 advertisement, but this is uh, um, often presumed in many others that the audience um, is directed often at a, a man of a household or a head of household um, in, during the dictatorship years, in, presumably um, as this, so the person who has control of the finances and the budget of the house. And therefore, it, it would ultimately be in order to buy any kind of major purchase, such as a, an appliance, a, a washer, dryer, really just a washer or other things. Um, it would be, uh, it would require uh, the man's consent and actually potentially initiative too. So we often see that those um, audiences are intended for men. This is no exception. Kelvinator, la máquina de lavar. Okay, there we are. I also think uh, if you allow me a crack, it says that it's the washing machine. That's actually kind of a poor or at least generic. <laughs> Um, a jingle, if that's the case, that its trademark is the washing machine, but that's the Kelvinator. Let's watch another one here. You're going to see a dialogue between a husband and wife. Me parece que me ha quedado estupendo. Ojalá le guste. ¿Qué pinta más buena tiene esto? Debe estar riquísimo. Es emocionante pensar con qué cariño lo habrá preparado. Se ha tenido que pasar la mañana en la cocina. Mm -hmm. Qué bueno te ha salido. Qué alegría. Me ha acertado. Qué acierto fue también elegir una cocina corcho. Mi cocina corcho. ¿Cuántos momentos felices como este me vas a proporcionar? Okay. Me parece que me... So she begins uh, by taking out a platter. She's been cooking all day. Me parece que me ha quedado estupendo. And she says, I think, it, I think it turned out great. I think it turned out wonderful, actually, this dish. Ojalá le guste. I hope he likes it. Qué pinta más buena tiene. It looks really fantastic. Esto. Debe estar riquísimo. It must be es emocionante pensar con qué cariño lo habrá preparado. It's exciting to think about, or it's actually moving to think about how much time she's put into and energy into making this meal. Se ha tenido que pasar la mañana en la cocina. She must have spent the whole money, the whole morning in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> qué bueno te ha salido. And then the only actually spoken, not voiceover, internal monologue is the man who um, is tried the food and says, um, it, you tur it turned out really well, it turned out really great. Qué alegría, he acertado. Qué acierto fue también elegir una cocina corcho. I'm so happy 
It was such a great choice that I chose corcho. Mi cocina corcho. ¿Cuántos momentos felices como este me vas a proporcionar? The, cor the appliance brand corcho. Um, yeah, how many um, happy moments uh, this is going to bring me in the future, right? So we also see, of course, this question that I'll let you interpret between um, speakers, the question of monologue and inner monologue, which is by the voiceover and the actual spoken speech itself. I'll let you get into that yourself in your notes. <clears throat> okay, let's go into the future a little bit more then and take a look at an advertisement from, let's go 80s and then 90s. <clears throat> well then, here we are. Um, this is in, uh, I wanna show you three in a row. Um, in, well, this is a whole compendium of several, but I wanna show you three specifically. So let's take a look at that now. Okay. All right. Um, in, in terms of the, the big ad, uh, I'd like to ask you in what ways are, are the pens gendered? <laughs> there, in what ways are the pens gendered in the advertisement? So let's begin there. Go ahead and take a moment. In reference to the other two ads, which is Nestle Chocolate and SOS Rice, uh, SOS as it's referred to, SOS, right? We see um, it's a very standard brand of, of uh, Spanish rice that it, it exists today. Um, in, we see two families, <clears throat> we see family scenes, um, and I'd like to ask you then about the role of those families, the way that they're presented, the way that they're represented. Um, particularly in the second one, the SOS of the Sos Rice, we see them um, in different activities together, and there are very specific roles or social roles that the um, you know, woman is playing and the children are playing, even within the gender <clears throat> of the children, and also, <clears throat> excuse me, the husband. Um, and so uh, take note of those things. So who do you think is the intended audience for these three advertisements? <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you'll allow me to, to also make an observation, um, SOS <clears throat> doesn't quite have the connotation, but it, it has the added value for us. If, um, if you're a native English speaker, of course, if you are not a native English speaker, but on sort of get the, um, what we could interpret as SOS, here she's writing with the finger on the table, SOS, like save, it's almost like save me. Um, but that's actually not implied in the Spanish whatsoever, but it, it's an added, uh, it's a, it's a kind of added joke that we could get out of it if you like. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Finally, I'd like to uh, see the last one. One uh, of this selection that's referred to, although there are others in the reading for today. This is by a cologne or about a cologne called Baron Dandy. Baron Dandy um, is a, it's marketed as a, uh, a man's cologne, um, particularly to a working class in population or um, also sometimes middle class population. Um, it's sort of like a stock variety of an inexpensive cologne or acquirable cologne um, <clears throat> that comes in, in a mass quantity in quite a large um, bottle or a can. 
um, it, and is considered to be accessible, particularly uh, maybe among like a say like a grandparents generation um, or older. Um, Baron Dandi is something that comes from the mid 20th century, really um, from the 1960s on, I want to say, but we see as late as the 90s um, still advertisements for it um, in, and some that seem out of place for the new context of the 90s, which is what our author is getting at and those social changes taking place under the transition to democracy that um, show us these sort of fossilized notions of masculinity, femininity, and idealized social roles that don't necessarily correspond to the social reality everywhere in Spain, particularly a changing Spain. So here we go. <clears throat> Esa fragancia. Barón Dandy Internacional. Reafirmo lo dicho. Barón Dandy Internacional. Un intento de seducción. Barón Dandy Internacional. Compromete de la fragancia solo para hombres. Ok. So <clears throat> we see um, an interesting twist or turn that by the 90s, the portrait is one of a um, or attempts to place um, in this uh, woman figure within a, um, an empowered role that she is the one who's choosing her mate. Um, and in, nevertheless, what really undermines this is um, the fact that the, the, the centralization of her empowerment um, and particularly the handcuffs at the end um, it are signs of subjugation in ways that completely undermine any kind of a context of empowered woman, um, in, uh, at least as it is presented within this advertisement. Um, the notion of archetype masculinity um, here is one we even see reinforced by the, the, the uh, announcer's very low voice. Um, in fact, it evenly seems like it's um, the, gra the grave or the, 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 the gravitas too of the voice and its pitch is almost exaggerated to be able to, ex to um, assert a kind of masculinity um, in, in, this, in this scenario, as well as the saxophone in the background, all of it together, kind of romantic, romantic love. Um, in, we see then in that sometimes, of course, advertisements that aim to defamiliarize, in other words, take something familiar and, um, and then invert it or somehow change it so that it defamiliarizes our context. Something that, for instance, in this case, instead of having a man choose uh, the lineup of women, as one might presume from a uh, prior, prior era, uh, era or even this one, we see that it's reversing the role so that she's the one who's choosing. And nevertheless, it's still undercut by uh, a question of her mm, is subordination or um, is, that the priority here is a portrait of, of masculinity and the power of a man um, over a woman, ultimately. So, in other words, we see that sometimes these forms of defamiliarization aren't, uh, don't, still don't, uh, they can expose um, a form of patriarchy and, and so on, or even sometimes sexism, et cetera, um, but they might not actually be um, themselves as, uh, let's say, revolutionary as their aim. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> So what I would like to um, show you today, too, is, here we go. In the advertisements, here we are, in Rosalia, I'd like to show you um, a couple of videos but, for, but also the album um, yeah, that launches uh, Rosalia's career um, for, to international projection outside of Spain. Um, yeah, Rosalia is um, of a more, let's say, classically trained flamenco background um, yeah, and is from Catalonia. Um, yeah, and the, the tropes that she's working with in her first truly commercial um, 
album, which is this one, um, are ultimately um, in direct reference to a folkloric tradition and into um, in those references to sort of quintessential Spanish culture that we see or have studied from the 20th century um, to the present. So what is it that you see here that reminds you or that you would associate with Spanish culture in a way? Um, some of you might say that this, this in, in terms of national identity, um, it reminds you of some, of some of the cultural imaginary that you had about Spain before um, you were even interested in, in studying about Madrid or in Madrid or about Spain generally. In other words, probably some of those archetypes or stereotypes too, including say bullfighting, uh, religion, the Christianity, but particularly Catholicism. Um, and so on. In other words, we see that there are very specific elements here that are at play already. Okay, what's interesting about this is that we see then too that the, um, yeah, the folkloric tradition is, in, what keeps a folkloric tradition alive is not the fact that it's static at all. Um, folklore is constantly reinterpreted. It's constantly changing over time. Um, and in fact, it's that character to it that it's being reinterpreted, that it's malleable is precisely what keeps it alive. So in this case, we see that the, um, yeah, the folklore tradition is being updated, so to speak, for today's context. In other words, it's brought into say the drag races of um, uh, souped up cars and tuned cars. It's brought into working class environments of truck stops, um, truck drivers and also welders, right? We see in other words like manual labor um, in, and particularly working class references here. We also see the style of uh, rings and so forth being associated with a very specific style of urban or urbanite cultures from the popular classes, in other words, working classes, um, it, the jewelry, the nails, etc. cetera. Um, but we also see then too, um, some other popular culture forms like skateboarding, you know, as I mentioned before, drag racing and so on, motorbikes. Um, all of this forms part of it, sort of the updating of this cultural imaginary I was mentioning before. A perfect example of this mixture is this um, purple dressed guy here. Um, it, the purple suit with the hood, the pointed hood, would be a, a penitent. It's a, a, what a, a penitent wears when they march in the Easter week parades. Um, in other words, when you see that, it's a religious symbol in Italy and in southern, in Spain, Portugal, and in southern Europe, generally Mediterranean. Um, in, in other words, it's, it forms part of the Easter week tradition, and yet that solemn Christian tradition or Catholic tradition of penitence here is actually taken to be like a skateboarder. It's modernized, right? So we see the fusion or reinterpretation of the two. Um, we're going to see other elements of folklore such as flamenco in particular in the next one I want to show you and I'll with that analysis I'd like to ask you to um, analyze this last music video by Rosalia. This is also from the same album. <clears throat> there we are. Pienso en tu mira which is an abbreviation for pienso en tu mirada. I think of your, um, in, I think of, of the way that you look, your gaze, literally, right? After this commercial announcement. Um, in, we're going to see a narrative. It begins with um, in, an image of a flamenco dancer, um, again, from that folkloric tradition of flamenco and guitar and so on, but here a dangling from a truck um, as an ornament from a truck, the mirror, the rear view mirror. Um, it, it, there are so many elements here and some of them in reference to this notion of archetype masculinity that we were studying today and in the past few weeks, um, in the past two weeks, given the commercial advertisements, you're going to see a reference to Baron Dandy. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, my question to you, the subject of this um, is, or the subject of this video and the content of the song is about a woman who is uh, about to leave an abusive relationship. Um, and, and so um, here, in fact, it's, um, I think of, your, um, of your, your way of looking and we're going to hear her singing about what is considered to be um, uh, the, the fear that she has when he, come, when he goes out to the street, the idea of him coming back drunk, potentially violent. We're going to see some uh, moments of violence or references to violence. 
Um, and then also it says here, celos. Celos means jealousy in Spanish. So I wanted to, to shape that, which will, that context will help you analyze some of the images that we're going to see here. Without further ado, um, here we go. My question to you, um, in, let's presume this is a cultural analysis piece. Um, what cultural codes do you need to access the way in which the flamenco tradition is represented and then also how it's updated to today's context? And that's where I'll leave you today. Thanks very much.